So next up, we've got Curtis, our CEO, who's uh, going to talk you through our strategy and how the pricing has been decided for next year based on that. Thank you, Jen. I, I want to put your minds at rest with one thing. The reason be that bringing up a chair isn't an indication of how long I plan to talk. It's because I've got a herniated disc in my back and I can't stand very long. So, so I'm not going to talk that long, sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so sorry about that. I, I just can't stand for many minutes. So um, I'm um, going to talk about the, the pricing strategy, the pricing model that we announced uh, with the budget uh, that we sent out. Well, three weeks ago, I hope, because the GM is, tom is tomorrow. Uh, and, um, but leading up to that, I wanted to talk a little bit about Link's strategy and how we think about strategy. This is something we, I don't think have ever talked about to the membership before, or, or um, at least not in any great detail. Now, it's in the, a little bit in the nature of company strategy that there is only so much you want to talk about in public uh, and, and go into, into detail. But we, we do want to actually give some insight into how we, we think about this and how we, we see the world and why we have made some decisions and how we came up with a new pricing model. So I'm going to say a little bit about what we uh, what we see and what we think around this area. So the, the process behind Link's strategy de development is that we, we tend to write a three-year strategy at the time, and then every year uh, this Link's management team together with the Link's board uh, all come together at a, at a strategy retreat and evaluate this and, and test this against market developments, feedback from the membership, feedback from the member survey, uh, and, 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 and a lot of other data points uh, that we use, uh, use to look at this. Uh, Richard beat me to it by talking about the safe process and the internal prioritization projects, uh, and this strategy then translates into the work we're doing links through roadmaps that every team writes, which is on an annual basis, and we then use also as part of what Richard showed uh, earlier today about how we do the prioritization of work inside links and what ideas and work we decide to do. And that's all linked together and comes together from the strategy, right? That's all derived from there. Uh, the strategy is also, of course, linked to our vision and mission statement that have been the same for 10 years or so, uh, and, uh, and, and it hasn't changed, right? And they also, they also derive, the strategy is, is, is framed within those statements. So some observations that, that we start with when we do this strategy work is that links us around 880 members from 84 countries. Now, this is a very diverse membership with very, very different expectation and needs when it comes to interconnects, right? If, you, if we went to survey them, and where we do, we get some very, very divergent uh, uh, views and feedback of, of what their needs are. Another trend that has been going on for many years now is that the very large growth in traffic is no longer on public interconnects, right? The, the large, medium, eyeball traffic to content is no longer going over public exchanges. Now, in Lynx's case, some of this traffic still passes through us because we handle all the PI and cross connects and so on. But this has basically moved away, that growth has moved away from exchanges and is also, to a very large extent, handled by in-network caching and, and other means of delivering this than, than what we normally have done or historically have done up until maybe 10 years ago. While we see growth, and we're, the primary drivers for growth have therefore changed. So when I joined this industry, the growth of public ex exchanges was simply as an alternative to peering. Essentially, was to avoid paying me at KP and Quest and UUNet and whoever else they were, Neil at Cable and Wireless, um, to avoid paying us money. You know, it's a very bad thing to do, but no, it still happened, right? And. Um, <laughs> And uh, the, the, uh, as, this, as the market evolved, we're sort of seeing the very large traffic flows from content being exchanged to exchange points, um, and then that has now moved away, and where we see a lot large part of the growth today is in, uh, well, long tail, for lack of a better word, essentially all the, all the exchange of traffic with content that isn't going over the private interconnects. Uh, we're seeing um, private interconnects, uh, for lack of a better word, and there's a bit of overloading of terminology, but where we see the uh, private VLANs, the cross-connects that we provide, closed user groups, or, or other particular flows that happen over the public exchange, that's all part of the growth that we see. There's, we, we're seeing more and more members are joining links, are joining this for very particular reasons, right? You know, we, we have had networks join us because they want to see a single route from a single member, and that was enough of a business case for them to join, right? That, that, that was not something that would have been the case 15 years ago, right? But today we see that. 
Uh, we're seeing an increasing ask for cloud interconnects. We know that something that's growing even among our existing membership, and this can happen over both the public exchange or, or, or uh, through some of the cloud products that, that Mike's been talking about in the past. And these interconnects, especially when it comes to these particular routes, they tend to come in. A lot of the, the, the new members you see join links are not from the traditional member segments as being ISPs or, or hosting providers. Right? They are banks, insurance companies, uh, we have shipping companies. You know, these are members who are joining links for very different needs than we have seen in the past, but they can still be satisfied at links. But this is a very different change in what we see in driving growth than we might have seen in the past, right? So we're also seeing competition increasing. Now, that's in, in, if you look at market theory, you know, any market matures, there's nothing new in here. There's nothing shocking or surprising that the market matures. The market will mature. You'll see increased growth. Uh, if you start doing proper business tree, that theory, the next step is mergers, mergers and scaling. But you know, let's not let's let's put that off for a while. Right? But but uh, what we are seeing is this um, increase in competition. We know that that's happening across um, all markets or segments. If you want, we see this in in the geographical markets. We see this in, in uh, among segments, um, and this uh, uh, this competition is driven by by sometimes very strong competition and also extremely well-funded competition, you know, funding that goes way beyond anything that links could ever match, right? But again, that's, that's, part, of, that's part of being uh, active in any business, but we had to be aware of that. And what we're also seeing is that competition is coming from uh, the fact that, that links existing members are, are having needs that are much wider than we have delivered in the past, right? There's much wider interconnection or definition of interconnection than just peering uh, at the public exchange. And, and that's something we're seeing as well as, as being increasing uh, in, in competition around this. So what does this mean for links when we develop a strategy then? So um, th there is no one size fits all, right? There is not a single strategy that we're going to develop that's going to be pleasing and exactly matching every single of those 880 members, right? You know, it's going to be a, we have to take in the feedback and try to optimize across the board and try to find the best fit strategy that we can do and provide it and, and deliver a strategy that, that provides the best value capture for as many members and a wide set as possible, right? Because our goal as, as board and staff is to define this, this value capture, value takeaway that you as members can go and think that this is something we really got out of links and this is why I'm a member of links, right? So, so that's part of the, how, we how, this, this, how we measure the successfulness of this. And, and as part of that, uh, one of the strengths, or the, you know, probably the biggest strength links has is actually this, this large, the size and diversity of the membership. So delivering on that promise and, and making that available uh, is actually the, the, the successful outcome of a strategy, right? And that's what we, how we tend to think about it. So we have defined a strategy for a few years around the four pillars, if you want. Uh, pillars is such a cliche, but they're not even pillars, they're four boxes, but anyway. Uh, they, they, um, there is four uh, main trends of what we have talked about. One is economics of scale, and in this we have encompassed uh, um, uh, quite a lot of different uh, uh, parts of this, and I want to explain this is that the way we describe this is this is uh, activities that would fit under one of these pillars. So. Um, we have the automation that, that Richard talked about this morning. Um, we have um, partnership, we're going to talk more about this in a second, cost management, leading architecture. All of this is things that fits under this. When we say that M&A fit under here, that doesn't mean that we have a hidden agenda where we're going out and pricing every single exchange point in Europe. That's not what we mean. But if there were ever links to do a M&A or we saw some opportunity or whatever we'd even mean by that word, that would be contributing to this. That doesn't necessarily mean that we see as our strategy is that we're going to go out and price our exchanges. Right? We, 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 we're not, by the way. Um, we had a regional IXP strategy. That's something we had for quite a long time. Uh, that's the work we're doing in Wales and Scotland, uh, for example, and, and bringing this out and, and trying to identify all the other markets, other needs in uh, servicing uh, interconnection needs across the UK in the regional markets that we can do and satisfy somehow. That's, that's all the activities we do under that pillar. And um, broad and interconnection offerings, that's what I talked about before, is that we see increasing needs among the existing members to have a complete package, a complete takeaway from us in what we offer. Uh, Mike's talked about this in the past, and, and uh, we'll, we'll hear more about this later today as well, about the marketplace and how we provide this to members. And then we have last, this is, again, we call this long tail. This is the 
supporting and uh, the, the members that we have and providing the best class of service to them. So this is making sure that new members who come to links that we actually deliver on the promises that they think they get from coming to us. It's to support overseas members. This also, by the way, supports UK members as well, but providing route servers, providing um, features of the existing exchange points that, that, they, that all members want that, and that we meet those needs. And that also includes pricing, which is what I'm going to come to in a second. I want to stop for a second about economies of scale, because this is something that comes up quite often and, and in our discussions with members. And as we do increased automation, and, we do, and, and automation, and this is Richard talked about in more detail this morning, is quite a wide topic, right? This is all the digital transformation we do. So it's the tooling for the knock. It's the, um, the way that this, the sales and marketing teams can work more efficiently. There's all of that goes into the, the, the automation of financing tools. All of that goes into automation, right? It's not just the network automation part of this. It's making sure that we can scale and handle more of the work we do more efficiently as links grows. And actually, we have, I think, done quite well in this over the years, and, and we, have, we have seen those efficiencies grow, right? Um, and, and running links, at a, and I'm going to come back to this, but the running links at the scale we are at the moment is actually quite a fixed cost. And, and even if we see growth, and we continue to see growth every year, um, the cost doesn't grow in, in the same scale necessarily as we do with that. As a matter of fact, we, pr we cut prices every year, right, which is indicating that, that we are growing uh, the scaling capability quite high. Right? Um, the partnerships we have done with, for example, JEDX and Manx IX are also part of achieving these economies of scale. So for us to take on those partnerships doesn't actually add any cost to us. And as a matter of fact, they, they, they probably do it the other way around. Um, and we don't cross-subsidize them. Now, these are, on the other hand, they are commercial partnerships we can't disclose. Uh, it wouldn't be right for us to disclose what's implied by those partnerships. But they are not cross-subsidized. We're not taking revenue from Loan 1 to build and fund these projects. Um, but they are building on sharing the resources we have and the building on the, the scale we have by what we have delivered already. And that's quite an important thing to realize and think about these partnerships when we, when we have announced them in the past. Um, we do have, and this has been a discussion, discussion in the past year, is we have products that have a fairly low, low degree of automation or, or that we can't automate very far. Um, but they might have a, a relatively high cost compared to that, which is, you know, for example, structured cabling that we provide. And one of the things we have said, and, and this is what was announced last year, is that we want to make sure that they at least to some degree cover the cost. Now, that doesn't mean that each of our product lines has to be completely self-isolated and self um, and we, we look at every product standalone, making sure that they, 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 uh, they generate their own money, um, because there's also a network effect of having this full size. But they have to at least, to some degree, do that, or, or mostly do that. And that's the analysis we have been doing and going through what our cost basis and what our products are, and how, do we, how is this balanced. Right? And that's some of the work we have seen going on. And we shouldn't underestimate the network effect also by having having this complete set of products and, and uh, exchanges that we run is also very much of the value takeaway or value capture members get from being members of links. I, I'm not going to go through this. is more an illustration than, than, than how the strategy process and how we break this down from the, the, the mission statement um, that you will have seen before. It would be the same for, for many years. Um, the strategy, the way that we have tried to word it in a, in a, in a soundbite is this to create value for existing members. We need to offer services across um, the interconnection spectrum. That's, uh, I can't actually read this either on the distance or here. I need to get glasses. But anyway, um, that's an attractive point when you can read it but better than I can. Uh, and then we have some objectives we define with that, which is around the market development process improvements that Richard talked about this morning, uh, people development, which is, of course, quite internal to links, um, but also product development that Mike's been talking about and how we'd grow this going forward. So that's sort of what our thinking about strategy and how we, have, how we see the world going forward and where, what, what our thinking is around what we at Links need to achieve and develop on and deliver on, not just develop, by the way. So this was the starting point when we came to the, to the pricing model. And we, we have, uh, for some time, got feedback around Links pricing and, and how the Links pricing uh, works. And, and we decided to, to at the mid, middle point of this year, to... Um, um, to look at, what, at a complete retake on how we do pricing and, and how could we change the pricing model to actually address the concerns raised by members. So one of the most common uh, feedback we got was about the, the, 
the upgrade path. How can a member with a certain peering capacity go to the next level or grow their services with links? And that the step from one to 10 gig, for example, was quite a big step from 10 to 100. They were very big steps in investments and cost structure. So that was one of the things we wanted to address. We also wanted to make sure that we supported the new products we have as private VLAN and cloud services. One of the other feedback we got was that, so I pay for this peering port, and then you asked me to pay for the services on top of that, having I paid for this twice. And there's a little bit of truth in that, maybe. And especially more recent, it made it very uncompetitively priced, because we were essentially were charging way more than we necessarily should do for a service. So decoupling those somehow seemed a logical thing to do. And we also wanted to make sure that we, for the future, could do a much more flexible pricing model uh, based on what was, what, whatever happens in the future than what we had in the past. So I want to stop there. But one other thing that's also worth noticing is that some other feedback we quite often got is that, well, how come Link's port price is X when the CapEx report is Y? Now, to be clear, Link's port pricing has never been cost plus or, or, or the capex by x percent, right? And even do capex plus cost, cost of goods sold, you still wouldn't come out to their pricing. When we do pricing, we actually have to look at the total cost of running links and the total cost of providing that service, which is everything from 24 by 7 NOC, the admins, the ISO 27,000, the telecom security requirements that as a government being put on us, although it's new, but it's still quite a big cost to us, right? Um, development of the portals, uh, legal, all this comes together to the total cost of running links. And then we have to make a judgment on how we, uh, based on that cost, can allocate this in a fair and, and competitive rate and uh, at the price point that makes sense. Right? That, that's, that's essentially how the, how the pricing is done. So there's no simple equation that the capex of a port is, is Y pounds and therefore uh, the port price should be the following. Now, there is a scaling factor, and, and we do make a judgment call on this, but, but that's how we work through the pricing uh, with the board when we do the pricing every year. So this year, we held a number of workshops internally among staff and with the board uh, around the pricing strategy. And the, the, there's a few things that came out of that. The first main decision was that we separated uh, the port access fees from the actual services on top of those ports, right? And we, at the same time, decided to introduce a number of new bandwidths that you could buy uh, on top of the fixed ports. That's the peering services that we defined. Uh, and this would meet these objectives we had set out on the slide I said before about having the scalable upgrade path and, and allowing new services on top of the ports and flexibility for the future. The starting point when we did this pricing was that, that a 10 gig peering service over a 10 gig fiscal port would be the same price, well, the price that comes afterwards, but would be the same price as it was uh, last year, and then we deducted prices from there. And then we started working out the other pricing again, using judgment uh, across those pricing bands. And we also decided that the, the one gig peering service on the lands would continue be, to be included inside the peering, uh, sorry, inside the membership fee. So the services we defined was, um, uh, we unbundled, uh, the port fee from the peering fee, we decided that. Um, so you will need to buy a port and then you need to buy a peering service to be delivered on top of that port. The peering services are one, two, and five gig, uh, one, two, five, and 10 gig delivered over 10 gig physical ports and 30 and 100 gig delivered over 100 gig port and 400 gig delivered over a 400 gig port. There were some questions uh, why we didn't have various services out of the 400 gig port, and, and um, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, we decided to at least deliver the 400 gig ports first, and then we can start refining the products over them. Right? But, but yes, we are aware that there might be some needs in the future for services across the 400 gig ports, but that, that we're not there yet. And why did we pick these bandwidths? So we looked at the, the current statistical distribution, the current use cases for the ports we have, and what we saw was being the most asked for bandwidths, and what we saw was the most likely upgrade paths, and that's how we, we picked these numbers. We didn't make an unlimited number of these products because we wanted it to be manageable, because of course the more products we have, the more complexity it becomes from our side. So we wanted to have it fairly, fairly simple and fairly uh, straightforward to do this, and that's how we picked these rather few, few ports, or a few speeds. So 
the port fees will be consistent uh, across all the lands. So a 100 gig port in Nova will be the same as a 100 gig port at Lon 1. But the cost for the peering services vary across the lands. So, uh, and we said this already that 1, 2, and 5 gig are delivered, and 10 gig, you should say, is delivered over 10 gig, and then we had a 30 and 100 gig deliver over 100 gig. And when I buy my, my total monthly price, then will be added up by the membership fee, the port fee, any peering fee, or any other services I buy on that port. So if I have a cloud access or, or private VLAN, that adds up on that as well. At the same time, it is not necessarily related to to pricing per se, but we decided we looked at one gig ports and phasing out of one gig and how we will do this. Um, so what we said is that we will discontinue sales of one gig over one gig fiscal ports as of January the 1st, but any existing members will ca can order more of these and continue, continue to upgrade them. Um, but we have said uh, that January 2024 will be the end of life. Well, this, our current thinking is that this will be the end of life for one gig ports. Uh, so we will phase this out as, as over time, and it will give, give members enough time to, to stop planning for this and moving away from this. The price cuts, um, you might have seen this. So what we have decided is that if you take a, what I call the equivalent service, so this is if you have a 10 gig port with a 10 gig peering service on it, uh, you will get a 5% price cut uh, from 20, uh, 1st of January 2022. And if you have a 10 gig peering service with a 10 gig fiscal port on any other land, you will get a 10% price cut uh, from 1st of January 2022. Why this difference and why, why have we picked this? So when we decided on this change, we have done quite a bit of modeling to what this means for Link's finances. But there's only so much modeling we can do because at the end of the day, how much revenue we'll have next year is going to depend on the behavior of all the members with the new pricing structure and new pricing model. And we, we can't predict that, right? We, we can model it, but we can't predict it. So this is a conservative estimate on our part. We want to be conservative so we see what it actually means in terms of revenue and what the uptake of the various services are. And going forward, we, we will evaluate this and we might do or might not do uh, other things with pricing, but as a decision point for next year as we go through this. But we will keep this trend. So this is us being very conservative about this, uh, given that we're doing a quite a wholesale change to how pricing works uh, and, and what that means for revenue for links. Right? Uh, membership fee will remain the same, uh, and it will continue to include the, the 10 gig access fee on each land with a 1 gig pairing service on each land. So that's included in the membership fee just like today, but it will be on a 10 gig port. Um, the, board, the pairing access fees for, for 10, 100, and 400 gig. Um, I'm not going to read through all these prices, and this is more in case anyone's not asking me questions. I, I should have them on screen so I can read them. Uh, and then we have the various pairing services fees, but these are all in the in the uh, in the document we sent out. So I'm not going to go through them. So that's the thinking and how we came to the pricing strategy and what we have been doing. So any thoughts, questions on this, Rob? Hi, for clarification, do you say that the membership is going to include a 10 gig port on a LAN or all LANs? You will get a 10 gig access port on every LAN, yes. On every LAN. But only a 1 gig peering service on every LAN. Correct. Yeah. Any other questions? You will stand. Maybe I talked so long I needed a chair anyway, but um, okay. Well, thank you very much then. Um, I, I'm, I'm still around here. Uh, I might not be standing up very long, but I, I, I'm happy to talk to you sitting down uh, if that helps. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. I'm not